today we are going to talk about worship. <laughs> We're going to talk about what it means to worship. And first of all, I want to do this. I want to welcome all of our locations. I want to welcome Cape. I want to welcome all the God behind bars locations. Let's give them a huge round of applause, all right? Yes. Well, years ago, I, I got the privilege of being able to um, be invited to speak in Rome, actually, at a youth conference. And uh, the organizers of this conference basically called me up and they said, uh, Jer, we'll fly you over and if you could speak a couple of nights at this youth conference and then um, we'll let you stay over a few days if you want to. We'll pay for your hotel and all that kind of stuff like that if you'd like to come. And I'm like, well, let me pray about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a chance of a lifetime to be able to do this, right? So I, I, I said, yeah, I'll go. And, and, and when I went there, um, I, I got to visit uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, which is in the Vatican City. And uh, this, this building, honestly, is like no other church that I'd ever seen before. In fact, um, it, it, it just was so vast. It, it had such um, an amazing, amazing kind of structure to it. I just, I'd never seen anything like it before. Before. And the vastness and the, uh, the elaborate architecture was absolutely uh, astounding, to be honest with you. And I, they just don't build churches like that anymore, you know what I mean? And, and especially in Europe, if you travel Europe, you'll see that there, there are all of these cathedrals and all of these churches that are just majestic. I mean, they have stained glass windows that are hundreds of years old, handcrafted, uh, marble columns that are majestic, stories tall. And when you walk in there and you sing or you clap, I mean, there's this amazing echo. These buildings literally took some of them dozens, if not some of them, even hundreds of years to build. I think of Notre Dame in Paris, took 182 years to build it. Imagine that. You're the architect. You've been, you know, in a sense, commissioned to build this cathedral. You don't even get to see it completed because it doesn't happen in your lifetime. I mean, think about that. And, you know, the, these churches were built to reflect the majesty of God. So when a person would walk into them, that literally they'd walk into this huge, vast space, and their automatic reaction was one of wonder and awe, all right? Now today, today we don't build churches like that. We build churches instead to be cost-effective, to accommodate traffic flow. You know, we pick carpet that hopefully has a good lifetime warranty to it and won't wear out too quickly, um, you know, we, we, we look at it very differently now, and I'm not saying that that's bad, but I often wonder, I often wonder this, and this is my point this morning, I often wonder if our culture, our present culture's approach to building churches is kind of like how we perceive God. It lacks majesty. <laughs> In fact, I often wonder if our worship, our worship is like how we now build our buildings, we want it to be cost effective and not cost us too much. And today I want us to focus in on what it really means to worship God. Now when I say that, I realize when I say what it means to worship God, you're thinking, oh, the songs that we just sang. Like worship are those songs that we sing right before Jer gets up there, whoever it is, and, and speaks. Yes, that would be included in worship. Singing is included in worship. But here, this is really important for us to realize today, is that worship is not just a song, it's a lifestyle. It isn't, it isn't just something that we dutifully do before someone gets up here and cracks open the word of God and begins to give a message, but rather for us to truly understand worship, it has to start with this truism and this truth that many times we don't realize, and that is this, when it comes to life, it's not about you. Now, the minute I say that, it's kind of like, what do you mean when it comes to life? It's not about me. Well, there is a purpose that is greater, far greater than your own personal fulfillment. There's a purpose that is far greater than your own personal peace of mind or even your own happiness. If you want to know really the purpose of life, if you want to know why you were created, why you were born, it has to begin with God and not you. And this is the reason why. Because creation doesn't know its own purpose. Creation has to look to the creator to find out why it was created in the first place. Do you understand that? So we tend to think that life is actually about us, and it's not. 
It really isn't. I realize today it's kind of like mind blown, but listen to this. You were born by God's purpose and created for his purpose. In other words, you were born by his purpose and for his purpose. Do you understand that? And contrary to popular belief, contrary to seminars and popular books and speakers and, and all of these things, you won't discover life's meaning by looking within yourself. If you look within yourself, you're only going to discover more confusion because the created cannot find purpose within itself. Do you hear that? Instead, only the one that created us is the one that can inform us as to why we exist. And here is why we exist. This is why we are created. You ready? To worship and have a relationship with God, our creator. That's the reason why you were created. You're like, why was I born? Very simply, to worship and have relationship with the one that created you. Worship is more than a song. Worship is more than a church service. Worship is the reason why you and I were created in the very first place. Now, across this congregation, online, on TV, at all our locations, at God Behind Bars, everywhere, we all have different careers, right? I mean, like, you know, maybe, you know, we were a teacher, or we're a teacher, a business person, a tradesman, an accountant, a salesperson. Maybe we're a barista, or a cook, or a nurse, or a business owner, or a pastor, all right? That's what we do. But it's a totally different conversation if we talk about who we are. Because what we do is not who we are. Who we are is something that we all have in common. Whether our profession and our career is different than the person sitting next to us, who we are is the same. We are created in the image of God. We are made in his image and created to worship him. So some of us might think that worship is just the thing that we do like before the message at a church. But if that's our mindset, if it's just about singing, then we're going to have opinions. We're going to have opinions about that activity. We're going to have opinions because if we think that worship is just the song that we sing, well, how about if we don't sing? Well, then I shouldn't participate because I'm not a singer, right? Or maybe I don't like the style of that music. Maybe, maybe like the worship has a style that isn't my style. You know, you might like traditional, you might like hip hop, you might like contemporary, you might like heavy rock or whatever else. And so you go, well, if the worship does not match my preferences, then I won't participate because it's only a song. Does that make sense? The worship is much bigger than that. If you sit there and say, no, you know what? Worship is just a song. Well, how about if that song is not your jam? Does that make sense? You see, you start having opinions if it's only about a song. You start having opinions and think, well, I won't participate today because it doesn't feel like it's me. Or, or maybe, you know, I, I can't sing or I'm going to show up late to service. I'm going to hang out in the foyer a little longer and drink my coffee because I, I really don't resonate with that song. You see, Worship is way more than a song. When I correctly understand worship is more than singing, then I realize that I was actually created to worship. I am the embodiment of worship towards one who deserves my praise and my worship. It's not about a song. It's not about a style. It's not about just the lyrics itself. All those things can be important and help, but at the end of the day, my life is worship. When I understand that, that changes everything. It really does. I understand that when I sing, I'm actually doing what I was created to do. When I work, I work with worship in mind. When I live, I live with worship in mind. I understand that all of my choices embody this idea and this practice of worship to the one that created me. My life is worship, and I bring glory to God with every breath that I take. You understand that? The animals can't sing, and yet all creation worships God, so will I. Does that make sense? We are to bring a smile to God's face, and I love what at one time was said when somebody talked about this, that God smiles when we love him supremely. God smiles when we trust him completely. 
God smiles when we obey him wholeheartedly. God smiles when we praise and thank him continually. God smiles when we use our abilities to glorify him. That whole thing that I just talked about, that's a life of worship more than a song. So today, I wanna give you just three thoughts about this idea and practice of worship. First of all, in worship, no one is a spectator. Everyone is supposed to be a participant. No one looks in onto worship, but rather we are to participate in worship. For those of you that are here for your very first time, though, let me just say this real quickly. You might be here for your first time, or you're watching online for the first time, and you might go, well, what does that mean for me? I am not saying that you have to just jump right in on something you don't understand. I'm not saying that, you know, you participate and raise your hands and all that kind of stuff like that. I am just basically saying this. We love people at City First Church that for the very first time, they are leaning into the idea of worship. We are all on a spiritual journey. This is a safe place to investigate faith. It's a safe place to come and listen and say, God, if you're real, speak to me me, it's a safe place. But what I am saying for all of us, but especially those of you that are newer, I'm saying this, lean into the idea that we were created to worship God, even if you don't all the way know who that creator is yet. Lean into that idea. And at your own way, in your own pace, participate in worshiping God. Think about it this week. Through your actions, through your words, and yeah, if you want to, through song, even if you can't sing, some of us in here, we can't sing. Don't look at your neighbor right now, all right? You can't. I remember years ago, I was um, actually in this room, and, and uh, uh, we used to have pews in here. Uh, they were uh, pink pews that over the years turned kind of like a dirty kind of like Pepto-Bismol color. Uh, and, and then we had burgundy carpet. And, and I remember it was that era I was in here, and I was on the front row, and Jen and I were worshiping, and there was literally a kid right behind me probably a five-year-old boy um, that was standing on the pew behind me, and we are singing, and literally he is shouting the lyrics. I mean, like, shouting. Like, no, no pitch, no tone. I mean, like, like, way off, screaming the words. I mean, his, his style was horrible. I mean, literally. And yet, he was all in it. He was in it to win it. I'm telling you right now, like he's in worship and he is just in it. He is passionate. Everyone around me, we're all just, we're, we're kind of singing and we're kind of like cracking up and laughing at the same time because this kid is literally screaming into my ear. We weren't singing Amazing Grace, but it kind of would have sounded like this if he was singing Amazing Grace. He'd be like, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. You know what I mean? It's like that kind of a thing, you know? And so we're all kind of laughing. I'm looking back at the parents. The parents are kind of embarrassed. They're like, uh, but I'm like, it's cool. It's cool, you know? It didn't bother anyone. You know why it didn't bother anybody? It's because even though the kid couldn't sing to save his life, his passion and his heart was contagious. There was something in it that was genuine, authentic, childlike, real. And I think God looks at us that way. He looks at us to be authentic, to be somewhat childlike. I didn't say childish, childlike. Childlike, even if we can't sing on key. Even if we're not perfect in our tone. Even if we don't even necessarily know all the words. Like we're kind of like, how many of you do this? Let's just be honest here. Let's have a, you know, kind of a reality check. How many of you sometimes when we're singing, you kind of mumble through some sentences, right? Because you don't, all right, right, okay? We all do that, okay? Okay, just, you gotta understand that even if you are doing that, God is looking at your heart. What gets his attention is your heart. Are you all in? You see, some of you might wonder why the music is louder here at City First Church. It's because your neighbor needs you to not be heard. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what. We love worshiping God even though we, some of us, cannot sing. Some of us have beautiful voices, and we're all jealous because someday we're going to get, the, get to heaven, we're going to sound like you, okay? But most of us in the room, we don't sound good. In fact, we're like, Holy Spirit, come back, come back, I promise. <laughs> God looks at our hearts. Like that kid. I think that day in a room that had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, probably God was most listening 
to his voice because he's listening to his heart. Second thought about worship. We understand and declare how amazing our God is. In worship, we do this. We, we, we talk about how, how big our God is, how majestic. One of the things, too, just so you know, how do you pick, like, the, the worship music? Why do you guys do worship the style that you do it? I'll tell you the reason why. We always pick worship that talks about how majestic and big our God is because this is the reason why. Between Sundays, life tends to beat us up a lot. So we need to remember our God is bigger than anything else going around us. Our God is bigger than sickness, bigger than the financial problem, bigger than the the marriage issue, bigger than the problem at work or at school. God is bigger. So we're going to talk about how big our God is. We get excited in worship, you know? And the reason why we get excited, even if our personality is more subdued, you know, your excitement might be this, all right? That's okay. And somebody next to you might be doing this, and that's all right. And the reason why we get excited is because we remember how big our God is. No matter how much the world crowds in, in all the brokenness and the hurt and all the pain and stuff like that comes into our lives, we remember that God is bigger. And when we worship God, our eyes come off of our challenges and our faith begins to grow. See, God deserves our worship regardless of whether we feel like it or not. Last night, Jen and I hosted a post-homecoming party for Christian Life Schools at our house, and literally, I don't even know how many kids got there in our house. I mean, like, literally, there, there were just kids everywhere. I mean, everywhere. There were, there, and, 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 you know, by the time I got to bed, I think it was like 1.30 in the morning, okay? And my alarm went off at 5.15, and I got out of bed, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I am so tired right now, and I have to talk about worship. Oh, you know, I mean, it's just like, I don't feel, I don't feel anything except I feel like getting back in bed. I realize there are Sunday mornings like that as well as Monday mornings, Tuesday mornings, Thursday mornings, whatever, okay? Yes, I will tell you, we feel many times many things, but at the end of the day, God deserves our worship no matter what we feel, no matter what we feel. He deserves our very best. And we don't base worship off of what we've done. It's another thing. Sometimes I hear people go, I can't worship God today. I've had people actually tell me this. They stay out in the hall, out in the foyer, because they don't want to come in during worship because they screwed up that week. And they're like, you know what? I I can't worship because if I worship or try to worship, God's going to reject my worship. They may don't use those words, but that's what they're saying. God always accepts our worship. You hear that? When our heart is authentic, when we reach out to Him. It's not based upon what we've done or haven't done. It's based upon who God is. Lastly, before we close, worship. In worship, we understand and declare all God has done. So not only who He is, but what He's done. By the way, He's done amazing things. A friend of mine recently also went to Rome, although he went this last summer, told me his story this week that that when he went there, he was touring the catacombs. Now, the catacombs were like underground tunnels under portions of the city of Rome where the Christians during the first century um, would hide because it's actually illegal to be a Christian in Rome and in that part of the world. And if you were caught being a Christian, you could be killed. Like the the religion was outlawed, you could say. And, and so and so, what they would do is they'd build these tunnels. I mean, they're elaborate tunnels and they would get in the tunnels and they would worship together. And then sometimes when they die, they'd actually bury the Christians in these catacombs. And so there's tombs all across these catacombs under the city of Rome. And my friend was touring and he noticed something on on the facade or the front of these tombs as they were kind of like dug into the wall, there would be a painting or there would be a mural of some sort. And it was a picture of the person and kind of told the story of their life. So you'd go by and go, oh, that person was a farmer. Oh, that person had a large family because the painting had that person and all these kids. Well, he went past this one tomb and, and it was a mural and it was this woman and she was standing there and her arms and hands were like this. It's like this, palms up, hands raised. And my friend stopped the tour guide and said, what do we believe the story is behind this person? The tour guide goes, oh, well, 
Historians believe that this follower of Christ, this woman, had received amazing grace. So they painted her with palms up and hands raised, like receiving grace. What's grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is get, not getting what you do deserve. So grace is receiving something that you don't deserve. And this woman, for one reason or another, we don't know what her life was. And we don't know if maybe she made some big mistakes. And she had as one of her primary characteristics that she was blessed and happy because she'd received amazing grace. When people raise their hand in worship, can I just say this? They don't have a question. <laughs> I first came to church and people were raising their hands. I'm like, what are they, what are they doing here? You know, the only place I saw that happen was in school. You know, people raise their hands. Why? Well, many different reasons. Here's a few. Maybe they're raising their hand out of excitement. It's just kind of an auto thing. You, you go to a concert or whatever else and you're like, yeah, you, it's, it's just a, something that God put in our DNA. We get excited, we raise our hands. So you'll see some people raise their hands because of excitement. Some people raise their hands because they're trying to say, God, I'm reaching out to you right now. I'm reaching out for your love, I'm reaching out your forgiveness, I'm reaching out to your character, that, that I, I need your strength. And God, thank you because you are a holy God or whatever. Can I also say this? Some people, maybe they're raising their hands because they're saying, I'm a recipient of great, amazing grace that I don't deserve. A life that has been turned around and new in Jesus. Blessings that I don't deserve. God, thank you. I'm a recipient of amazing grace. See, we worship God for who he is, we worship him for what he's done. I love what it talks about, the story in the Old Testament. It's a book of Exodus, and God is speaking with Moses. Moses is the man who God has chosen to lead his people out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt. So God is speaking to Moses, and Moses has to go and then talk to Pharaoh and convince Pharaoh to release all of the Jews out of slavery. This is what it says in chapter eight, verse one. Then the Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh and announce to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go. Why? So they can worship me. Do you understand that the response to freedom is always worship? Which means this, if you have had your sin forgiven, the response is always worship. It's not what you feel, it's not what you've done, it's the fact that you've experienced what God has done for you, and you're like, yes, God, I want to worship you. Closing with this scripture, the psalmist David, we just got done doing a series on him called Slay Like David. He was a warrior king. This is a man's man, and he was a great worshiper. Of God. I want to say that because sometimes we think in modern day church that worship is for children and females. Can I say this? Worship is for all of God's creation. So it doesn't matter who you are. You cannot be too manly to worship. Does that make sense? And so this is the thing. Here's David and David says this, and this is a Psalm or it's a song that he wrote. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the pit of despair. That's what God did, lifted David up out of the pit of despair and out of the mud and out of the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to God. In other words, David's saying, because I've been rescued, I have a new song. See, we're all, we all worship something. It's just, what do you worship? Because we're created to worship which means we worship something. We worship money, we worship success, we worship another person, we worship things, or we worship God. We worship something, we're created to worship. So here's David, and David says, because I've experienced the goodness of God and his rescue, I have a new song now that I sing. And it says this, many will see what he, meaning God, has done, and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. You know what? Worship is two things. It's vertical 
a celebration. God, I celebrate who you are and I celebrate what you've done, vertical. It's also horizontal, it's a proclamation. Celebration, proclamation. When I worship with my life, other people will notice and be amazed and put their trust in the Lord, David said. So therefore, what happens when you have something that's vertical and something that's horizontal? It's a cross. And the Bible says to take up our cross every day, which means this, it could mean too, that we are to worship God in a celebration and let there be a proclamation with our life. Do you understand that? That we take up our worship every day into our environments, into our school, into our workplaces, into our neighborhoods. So we're gonna end with a song today about Jesus. We're gonna lift up the name of Jesus. I want no one to leave unless it's an absolute emergency. We're ending earlier today. I'm not talking as long so that we have a moment that we can worship him. And I wanna say this, for some of us in the room, it might be the first time that we raise a hand because now we understand we're a recipient of amazing grace. For some of us, it might be the first time we actually sing because we've been afraid because our our voice is not that good, but today we heard about a five-year-old boy who probably captured the heart of God that day, even though he screamed out the lyrics and was probably tone deaf. It means that we also understand that all creation worships, so will I. So when we worship with our life and with our voice, may we do everything to glorify God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you right now for all that you are and all that you've done. Lord, you deserve our highest praise. You deserve our best. You deserve every ounce of our worship, which is not just what we're about ready to do, although it includes that. It's not just singing, it's our life. God, at the end of the day, our life, it's not about us. We were created to worship you and have a relationship with you. So in the next few moments, I just pray that you would be glorified. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Stand to your feet. Let's worship together.